Welcome to the Schools of Excellence podcast, a place for insightful conversations about building sustainable schools of excellence. Join me each week as we explore the importance of leading with your values, creating impact, and leaving a lasting legacy. My goal on the show is to provide you with clarity, elevate your mindset, and equip you with practical strategies and inspiration. I'm Khani Wolshansky, a proud mother of four, a former New Yorker, now savoring sunny Florida vibes. With a professional journey spanning 18 years across all levels of school leadership, I bring nuanced insight that delve into the intricate details of running a center, as well as the broader visionary aspects of leadership. Thank you for joining me for this conversation. Let's build a legacy of excellence together. Hey there. And welcome back to another episode of the Schools of Excellence podcast. So this is our final episode in our three-part series of Veteran versus New Staff. And today's conversation is all about leadership and decision-making. So I want to, again, just give some quick context to just, you know, what this series is about is these are not hard and fast rules about, well, all veteran teachers should be treated this way. And then, you know, all new staff should be treated that way. This is an invitation to look at your team from a different perspective, from a different angle, that the expectation of leadership is not about approaching every single teacher and every problem with the exact same way, right? There is no one size fits all. There is no recipe. There is no formula. Just like a teacher doesn't respond to child behavior in the exact same way. It's not good for a child's well-being that every interaction that they have with any of the adults in their life, that they're always exactly the same. Like it's perfectly, actually, it's quite great for a child to experience, um, you know, when we're, when they're with this teacher, this is how this teacher responds when they come over here, when they go to grandma's house, they have a, you know, there's different rules over there. It's important for children to understand that different environments call for different expectations or different settings um, and different standards. And when you're working with teachers, and we have a whole podcast episode on this, right? To let go of the fairness game. This is not about, well, I have to treat everyone the same. No, you don't. You're not supposed to. Treating everyone the same does not work. And it's not good for your staff or for your culture. So this lens of how veteran and new staff approach leadership and decision making, they really approach it in very different ways. And so I want to kind of give you some context to that and how you can support your staff, depending on, you know, the angle that you're coming to support them in. So the first thing I want to look at is curriculum planning. Okay. Veteran teachers really rely on their old models of curriculum planning, their methods, their materials that they've proven and perfected over years and years of experience. And there's a lot of beauty in the fact that they have all of this, you know, great resources that they can lean on. And at the same time, again, not every Everything is all good or all bad, right? So it's great that they have um, a lot of experience when they're bringing curriculum inside of the classroom. And at the same time, some veteran teachers need an invitation or a push, if you will, to go and try something different right? To go and, you know, yes, I know that you have taught the very hungry caterpillar like this for years and years and years, or, you know, every time you're introducing, you know, the summer series or Thanksgiving, or you're teaching about a new holiday or a new letter or whatever it is, you've always done it this way. And the kids have always loved it. And it's always been amazing. And the parents always love it, blah, 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 right? And they bring all these reasons of why they should continue doing it this way, because it works and it's great and everyone loves it. Um, and it's important sometimes to just push a little bit out of your comfort zone and just try something a little bit different. So when you're working with veteran staff, being mindful of where are they leaning on their curriculum planning of the years of experience too much, too heavily? And maybe let's, you know, try a different angle for a little bit. With the newer staff, right, a lot of them, because they don't have all these proven methods or whatever it is, some newer teachers will lean towards experimentation with new curriculum resources and they're looking to see what works best for students. And because they don't have all of these proven techniques, their curriculum planning is going to feel a little bit messy. And sometimes when you're reviewing their lesson plans or you're having, you know, some conversations with them, you might notice some gaps in, wow, like this curriculum over here that they're trying to bring in is 
really not developmentally appropriate or the time frame that they're thinking for how long you know, a two and a half year old could sit at a learning circle feels very like stretching, like that's a little bit longer than I think a two year old can sit for. So again, it's how you approach the coaching, right? It's how you approach the conversation with the newer teacher. Are you approaching it from the lens of, you know, how does she not know this? This is so not developmentally appropriate, or this is completely out of alignment with our company values, or, you know, we don't do worksheets or whatever. This is a play-based center, or this is a Montessori-based center. Like, why is she bringing those materials or whatever it is? Again, when you're working with a newer teacher in the context of curriculum planning, it's understanding where are they coming from, right? What is their training? What does it look like? So that's the first category. The second category is classroom management, okay? Veteran teachers have a huge repertoire of very established strategies that they've honed with experience, practice, and adaptation. And so they have their specific transitions and their songs, and they have very specific ways of how they move the kids from place to place, whether they're focusing on, you know, visual guides or auditory guides, or, you know, they come closer to the children, or they, you know, have certain songs that they sing that really hone in on the children's kinesthetic skills. Whatever it is, veteran teachers have a lot in their toolbox on how to manage the classroom. Now, Given all of the changes in child development over the last couple of years, and if you need a refresher, you could go back to the ECE forecast and child relationships that I did in the beginning of 2024, how child development and relationships have evolved since the pandemic. And so children are different today. There is a different need of child uh, of classroom management that is needed. And so a lot of veteran teachers might need more coaching on their own emotional regulation, right? On how they might be great at controlling the class or managing the class, but they probably need a little bit more support when it comes to managing their own emotions and managing themselves and managing the relationship that they have maybe with this new co-teacher who is a new teacher, right? They might be the veteran, but their colleague is a new teacher and they are struggling with managing themselves in these moments of management. So we're trying to get all these kids coats on and all these kids gloves on, or, you know, they all come back from the sensory activity and everyone needs to wash their hands because it's full of paint or shaving cream or whatever you played with. And the veteran teacher has her whole system of how she does it. And she's got a new teacher that doesn't really know how to manage this, right? So she's not used to the fact that, hey, when you bring in 15 two year olds that have shaving cream on their hands, there's a very specific system of how you need to instruct the kids to walk back into the classroom so they don't touch the walls and get shaving cream all over the place or get shaving cream on kids' hair or noses or clothing or whatever it is, right? It's, 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 experience will teach you that, right? Experience, it's a rookie mistake, as they say, when, you know, you have a teacher who's never taught toddlers before and all their, you know, kids have paint or shaving cream or something that's messy. They need direct instruction on how do you move 15 toddlers from this side of the room to this side of the room, from one classroom to another classroom without destroying the entire building. That is not something that a new teacher will know instinctively or intuitively how to do. She just won't because experience has taught the veteran teacher that, oh, when the kids do this, we need to tell them to squeeze their hands together like this, you know, crazy glue and don't let go of those hands and hold them high above your head and walk like that, you know, so that you don't touch anything, right? And you don't touch your friends and you turn into a fun game and you sing a song and you make the kids laugh and it's great. Why am I saying all of this? Because classroom management, when it comes to veteran staff, their support system might be about how do you help them manage themselves better in the context of classroom management or work more closely and cohesively with their colleague who might be a newer teacher because the newer staff are relying heavily on the guidance of their mentor teachers and how to implement and strategize the best classroom management techniques for this age group, this group of kids in this season. Right. Why am I getting so specific? Because classroom management techniques are not things you can rip off the Internet. You have to be deeply embedded in the classroom to understand the personality and the dynamics of the classroom and understand what strategies are going to work with this particular age group. And remember that children 
every single couple of months grow exponentially, right? So when I'm sitting down and having a conversation with someone who's a year younger than me or a year older than me, or even five years older than me or five years younger than me, I'm not you know, shifting the conversation because, oh, now I'm talking to someone who's 30. So, you know, I better be um, a little bit more careful about the words that I'm using or vocabulary because they're probably not going to understand me. It doesn't work like that, right? Like once you hit a certain age, age doesn't really matter so much uh, because you, you guys are a lot more on the same intellectual playing field. With kids, it is not like that. When kids walk into the school year at two, in September, and then in January, they're 2.5, they have added like hundreds of new words to their vocabulary. They have a completely different mental processing. They can sit for longer. They can follow more than one step commands. Like your the management techniques have to shift depending on the age group. And it's not just, oh, the, the threes do this and the twos do this. No, it's one second. They came in as two-year-olds. Now they're three. Have we shifted our classroom management strategy? Why am I saying all this? Because newer teachers might not understand that progression of developmentally appropriate practice that comes with more experience. And so the way that you guide the teachers through this with their leadership and the way that they're making decisions around classroom management, you need to take a different approach. Okay. All right. Let's go a little bit further. How do leadership and decision-making differ when it comes to parent communication? So veteran teachers, right, they typically have um, kind of this status or social standing, if you will, with the families, right? So I know when I worked in the school that I worked in for about eight years, um, I taught siblings at a certain point, right? So when I first came in, I taught, you know, this group of kids. And then three years later, I taught their younger siblings. And then two years after that, I taught those kids, younger siblings. And so there's a certain kind of status and social standing that I had inside of the school where the vast majority of parents knew who I was. So even if I didn't teach their child, they've seen me at parent events or social events, or they've seen, you know, my name on the school website, or they've seen, you know, work that I've done inside of the school or whatever it is. So there's a certain social standing and status that comes with veteran teachers when it comes to parent communication. Parents look at you differently. They respect you differently because of the stature that you have inside of the school. And so that is an advantage that veteran teachers have when it comes to parent communication. Okay. Now, Newer teachers don't have this. Um, I still remember uh, this was back when I was, gosh, I think I just turned 20, maybe. Um, yeah, I just turned 20. And um, I was doing a home visit. So when I worked in New York City, one of the things, one of the you know best parts of New York City is the fact that everyone lives you know so close to each other that way, right? You just go from this apartment to that apartment, or you take a cab five minutes down, and then you've got three other families that live there. And so one of the things that we did because I taught toddlers is before the school year started, we did home visits. So myself and my co-teacher, we would go to the child's house in the comfort of their home. And we would do a play date with the child and the caregiver, the parent, the nanny, whoever it was. Um, and this way the child got to see us before they even came into the classroom um, on the first day of school. So we were already not a stranger to them, right? We came to them in the comfort of their home and we had this whole activity that we used to do with them and it was great. Um, it was crazy uh, to run around all, all over New York City in August uh, in the dead of summer, um, but uh, it was definitely one of the ways that I really learned uh, the ins and outs of moving around the city. My point in saying this is we went to one of these houses um, and I was really young um, and I also looked really young. Um, and I was coming with my co-teacher who uh, wasn't that much older than me. Uh, I think she was 21 maybe or something like that, but I was the main teacher. Um, and this mother, uh, really came on strong, uh, to us when we came to the home visit, she was like, uh, how old are you guys? Do you have college degrees? Are you ladies in relationships? Like, do, you know, have you ever done childcare before? Like she was interrogating us. Um, and I was so insecure. I mean, for God's sakes, I was 20. Uh, this was only my second year teaching. Um, it was my first year as a lead teacher. And I rem like, I still remember that feeling of like, oh my gosh, like this woman's going to eat me alive. And 
the insecurity that I felt, a lot of new teachers feel that when they're hanging around families that have been in the school for a while, or even a newer family, like they just, they feel insecure around parents. Parents can be really intimidating. And so um, obviously, you know, now I, I, I laugh at that because now when I talk to parents, obviously I have such a different, and even, you know, a year and a half later, um, I had such a different experience when I was doing the home visits, even when a parent was like, how old are you? You're so young, blah, blah, blah. Like I just, I knew how to respond with more grace, with more authority, with more leadership. Uh, because what the parent's really looking for in that moment is she's looking to see, are you confident? Can you lead this classroom? Uh, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for your sense of self-assurance. And I didn't have that, you know, when I was little. Um, your newer staff are going to feel insecure with parent communication and your veteran staff are naturally going to feel a little bit more self-assured and confident. And so the way that they lead parent engagement or the way that they make decisions around parents, um, it's, it's going to be different whether you're a newer teacher or an older teacher and they need different coaching. Um, when I was, uh, I wasn't such a new teacher. I think it was like my second year teaching, uh, my second year as a lead teacher. So it was my third year uh, in the classroom um, and I taught the toddlers. And so, you know, at some point during the year, the children were getting uh, toilet trained. And I had this one particular boy uh, that I was toilet training. His name was Lenny. And um, he was having a really hard time. And his mom was having a really hard time. And she had just had a baby. And she was really wanting to get this kid out of diapers so that she wouldn't have two kids in diapers. And um, anyways... Lenny had an accident and she came to pick him up and I was telling her about, you know, what happened. And after I had told her, you know, he had an accident, I told her what we did. We changed him, the whole story. Um, she sent me a, she called me up actually later that day and she gave me a mouthful. She was like, I can't believe you told me that my son had an accident. All the other parents were standing there. I was so embarrassed that my child had an accident. You shouldn't have spoken to me in front of other people. You should have pulled me aside. You know, you didn't, you know, respect my, um, what was the word that she used? Um, she, she just, she felt really disrespected and humiliated. And I was like, so I was like traumatized. I was like, Oh my God, I'm going to get fired. I can't believe I did this. Like, you know, I should have used more discernment. Like, how did I not realize that other parents were listening? Like I should have pulled her to the side, all the things. And I still remember the director at the time, uh, you know, I called the director right away and I was like, by the way, this thing happened, um, you know, let me know how I should deal with it. Like, I, I don't really know what to say. Like, I just, I heard the parent out and I was like, thank you for telling me I'll get back to you. Um, and anyways, the next morning I came a little bit earlier, the director and I sat down and she really coached me through, um, one, what the parent's experience was like. And then she coached me through how to help the parent feel more secure in my presence, right? So that the next time the parent comes to talk to me, how I can ensure that she feels that I see her, that I'm validating her and that I do respect who she is as a person. Um, and I, I, you know, and I won't do that again. And she really coached me through that. And obviously it was a very difficult conversation for me to lead with this parent because I was so ashamed and I was so insecure about it. When you're working with newer staff, they are going to screw up, okay? They are going to make mistakes like I did, okay? So we all have a learning curve. And if you're listening to this, I hope you're laughing and remembering a story of something really, really embarrassing that you did when you were a young teacher, right? Or a new director or whatever it is. And you're like cringing at the thought of like, oh my God, I can't believe I did that, right? We grow up. We change, we evolve, we learn, we do better, all the things. But when you're coaching the leadership and decision-making with parent communication with younger staff, they're going to need some of that hand-holding and coaching. And your veteran staff, they they have a little bit of that stronger footing because they just, they know, right? Like once I became a veteran teacher, like I would never make a mistake like that again, right? Because well, one, I, at that point, I already had some of my own children, but also we just... We, when we know better, we do better. Okay. So let's go to the next area um, of leadership and decision making that really is different when it comes to uh, veteran staff and new staff. Let's talk about professional boundaries. Okay. 
this is something that can kind of go either way. So I don't know necessarily that this is like an always rule with veterans or an always rule with newer teachers. And there's very little kind of always rules unless, you know, you're doing physics or science or math or whatever it is. But um, veteran teachers have learned over the course of their career how to maintain professional boundaries with their colleagues, with the children, with the families. And newer teachers or kind of younger staff are still learning boundaries in general. Um, and so when it comes to professional boundaries, some of them can sometimes say certain things where you're like, oh, that is not information that you should be sharing in the teacher's lounge. Um, you know, or someone might say something at a staff meeting um, and, you know, everyone's kind of cringing under their breath, thinking like, OK, that was a little TMI. Um, professional boundaries are a skill. It's a learning curve and. It, it, it's very dependent on the person, but as as the school leader who is facilitating this kind of culture with your staff, really having conversations one on one with, you know, each of the teachers, because, again, I don't think this is about specific like, oh, veterans always act this way or new teachers always act this way. Professional boundaries are challenging. And when you're making decisions about what to share in professional boundaries, in professional settings, um, some teachers may need a little bit more direct instruction of like, this is something that is not for public conversation or public opinion. Um, or this is not something that we bring to the table for everyone to weigh in on. This is a decision between you and your significant other or, or whatever it is, right? Again, it's a learning curve. It's a process. And I'm sure you're thinking of someone right now who probably needs a little bit more handholding when it comes to professional boundaries and professional boundaries could be its own podcast in itself. But the context that I'm using it from is from the lens of decision making of what we share and don't share in a professional setting. So think about the, your staff and think about who maybe needs a little bit more direction when it comes to professional boundaries. OK, and lastly. Decision making in crisis, leadership and decision making in crisis. OK, veteran teachers can sometimes make quicker and more effective decisions in crisis situation and hopefully remain, uh, you know, rem keep their composure. So what I mean by crisis is, again, I'm not talking about crisis on the level that the leadership is answering, but like a crisis, for example, uh, when I was a veteran teacher. I had a child in my class who had a severe milk allergy, uh, dairy allergy, and it was very, very severe. Um, he had an EpiPen. We had, you know, speed dial with with 911. Uh, we actually had um, the fire department was actually right across the street um, uh, from the school. And so anyway, so he had this really bad milk allergy. And we were doing this uh, activity. It was in February and I was making uh, hot chocolate with the kids. This is, uh, you know, hot chocolate with with marshmallows. We were doing this activity for our winter theme. And I had a sub in my classroom that day. My colleague was out of town. And um, so I set up this activity and the whole time in my head, um, I knew that the, right, I have this kid, um, and he has a milk allergy and he, he's allowed to be in the room, right? He's not airborne. Um, and so he was going to sit at a different table and I'd actually had his mom bring, uh, this, uh, hot chocolate packet that was dairy free for him so that he could be part of the activity. Um, and like in my mind, like I knew, um, that this was something that I was going to take care of, right? But my co-teacher, she had texted them in that morning that she wasn't coming. So it was kind of a last minute thing. The sub came into the classroom and I didn't end up giving, you know, giving her over this information. Anyways, we do the activity and it totally slips my mind. And this kid ends up drinking the hot chocolate with the milk. And like three seconds after he drinks it, he comes over to me and he's like, He's like, more honey, I, I don't feel well. My throat's hurting me. And I was like, oh, oh, my God, he drank the milk. Now, 
this is a crisis situation. Okay, I have a kid who has a deathly milk allergy. We just drank milk. This kid's throat's closing up. I need to call 911 like this second. Um, he needs an EpiPen. He needs Benadryl, all the things. And, and I have a sub in my classroom. Um, and this is my fault. I'm the teacher. Like, this is my responsibility. I am responsible for this child. And I let him drink milk. Like, I couldn't believe what I had done. But the thing in that moment, right, how do you need a lead in that moment of crisis? I got to get out of my head because this is not about, oh, my God, what did I do? But I need to save this kid right now. OK. Um, and so I immediately you know, went into action. I had her stay inside the classroom. I called the custodian and I was like, come in here and be in ratio. Um, and she was like, but I'm clear. I'm like, no, no, no. You're here in ratio right now. I got to get this kid into the hospital. Um, so. We, we got it rolling right away. I called the parents. They, you know, they met, they, uh, I went with the child in the, uh, in the ambulance. We met them in the ER. Um, and he was fine. Thank God he was fine. We gave him the EpiPen right away. Like he was fine. Thank God he was fine. The mom, I called the mom later that night to apologize, um, and kind of talk to her about what happened. And I think what was so impressionable for me in that experience and just how, uh, just the decisions, the leadership in that moment. Um, she, she actually wasn't upset at me at all for making that mistake. She's like, listen, this mistake could happen to anyone. Um, she's like, the thing that I'm just so grateful for is you acted so quickly, um, because seconds matter when it comes to something like this in a crisis. And you were just so quick. It was like seconds later that, you know, that he was in, like already in the ER, uh, that he was already, you know, in the ambulance headed to the ER. And that this moment really, that experience has stayed with me for, for so many years. And this is gosh, going back almost 15 years at this point. My initial reaction was I was in a self-loathing state of like, I can't believe I let this happen, but I was able to instantly switch to, I have to take care of this child. I don't know how I would have responded if it was years earlier when I was a brand new teacher, right? And, and was just feeling so insecure about everything. And so again, veterans have a little bit of an advantage when it comes to making decisions in crisis situations. And newer teachers are, it's not only that they rely on other people for like, well, what's the protocol here, whatever it is. It's when you're younger, you're so afraid to make your own decision that you're like, what's the protocol? Again, there was no written handbook of like, oh, and if a child has an allergic reaction and you need to leave and go to the hospital, then pull whoever you can, even if it means pulling the custodian into the classroom. It doesn't say that in the handbook, guys, nor should it say it in your handbook. This is what discernment means in high stakes situations, right? I use discernment. Hey, Missy, I know you're sweeping the building right now but you need to come into this classroom because you are an able-bodied human and I have to exit this classroom. So when we talk about leadership and decision-making <clears throat> with newer and younger staff, make sure that you're providing role-playing and simulating these kinds of experiences that happen to anyone. Allergic reactions can happen to anyone. Guess what? The vast majority of allergic reactions actually happen under the guise of parents. Right. So the parent themselves, these allergic like eruptions happen in the presence of a parent. So this is not about poor supervision or poor vigilance or whatever it is. It's these things, unfortunately, happen. Allergic reaction happen. Kids fall. Uh, kids trip. Kids could get pushed like these things happen. And it's not about. Like, how many preventive measures do you have in place to make sure it doesn't happen? Yes, prevention is so important, 100%. And are you prepared and training your staff on how to deal with crisis and how to lead and make decisions in those moments? So I know this episode got a little bit longer, but I really wanted to, you know, share as many examples and stories as I can. And 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 I, what I want to conclude with with this series is that this is not a one size fits all when it comes to veteran and, and, you know, newer staff of like, well, all veterans as this way and all new. No, you can have a new teacher that, you know, has a lot of experience with allergic reactions and she would have been amazing in that moment. Right. It's it's the lens. It's this framework of where are there some gaps right now? with my veteran staff, with my newer staff. And based on what, you know, I heard in this podcast series, 
the whole series, not just this episode, where can I make some tweaks in the way that I'm conducting some one-on-ones, in the way that I'm leading uh, staff development, in some new trainings that I have going on? Um, just some flyby conversations. Where can I do some updates? All right. Thanks so much for joining me for this series. And I'll see you next week. If you are loving the Schools of Excellence podcast and have gotten any value out of it for your school and for yourself, I would love if you can do two things for me. One, subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. And two, can you please leave us a review? Reviews help other school leaders know that this is the podcast to learn about building a school of excellence. And I'd be so grateful if you can do that for us. Your help and support make this show be able to listen to by thousands of other school leaders around the globe. Thanks so much for listening and giving us your time and attention each week.